Hello everyone and welcome to this session as part of the Festival of Treasury Transformation from the ACT. I'd like um, to welcome my guests, all chief executives, uh, with fascinating backgrounds and roles um, in a moment. And um, by way of introduction, you've got their bios, so I'm going to suggest that um, they simply introduce themselves and tell us a little bit of, you know, how they got to become a chief executive, um, uh, you know, wh why they really, uh, why they wanted to be a chief executive and what they really enjoy about the role. And so if I might start um, in alphabetical order, let's start with Inga, please. Yeah, and thank you. And thank you for inviting me to this panel. Um, so uh, a, a bit about my background. I am the CEO of Save the Children International and uh, very short, Save the Children International is the, the, the biggest uh, INGO working on children's rights. Uh, we are focusing on education, uh, protection and, and uh, health. So those are the things that we do. We, we have uh, 25,000 staff in roughly 120 countries. Uh, so I, I am the CEO of this organization. I've been so since September last year. So I'm, I'm still on my first year and it's been ex an exciting first year with uh, a very unusual uh, uh, pandemic and, and a crisis that in none of us have ever seen before. So, so I will come back to that later uh, in the panel. But, but shortly about me, I, I have a, a long career as a civil servant. Uh, I, I am, uh, I, I've been working for the government in Sweden, uh, where I've been director general for, for several government agencies. I've also been working uh, with a lot of EU related issues. Uh, but at the same time as I've been doing that, uh, I've also been a trustee in Save the Children. So I've been on the board for Save the Children in Sweden, but also globally uh, for a period of 17 years. Uh, so, so I have a long relationship with, with the organization. And a little bit over a year ago, uh, the, the CEO position in the global organization became vacant. And uh, I realized that this might be something that I could do. Uh, and, and so that's how I ended up here. Uh, and it's, it's quite interesting also to change the, the, the focus from being a trustee in, in the global board to, to being the CEO. Uh, why did I want to become the CEO? Of, as you understand from, from just listening to, to my uh, relationship with Save the Children as an organization, I have a very long background with this organization. Um, I'm, I'm uh, passionate about our mission, about our, our, what we do. Uh, and being the CEO, of course, puts you in a situation where you can contribute to, to the mission of the organization. And, and, and for me, having the background of, of the trustee, being involved in a lot of the strategic discussions, it was really a, a challenging task. It is a challenging task to be able to execute uh, some of these strategic decisions. Uh, but at the same time, it's, it's very different, as I said, and especially in times like this. I, I really am attracted by challenges. So that, that is what makes me thrive in, in any position. And, and I also uh, like uh, complex organization and complex issues. And what really attracted me with Save the Children, apart from the mission around child rights, is also the fact that it, it is a global organization. So that's short about me and why, where I am and why. Well, thanks very much, Inga. And it's great that you've got that experience from kind of both sides, the board and the executive, and kind of know the difference between those two. So um, thank you very much. Shall we move on to Peter now, please? Yeah, thanks, Caroline. And uh, uh, again, great to be part of this panel, this webinar. I also sit on the ACT's advisory board, so it's uh, been fun interacting with the organization. So I'm the chief executive of the CIPD, so the Chartered Institute of Personnel and Development, which is the professional body for HR and people development. We have about 160,000 members and offices in Singapore, the Middle East, London, and Dublin, and been around, like many professional bodies, for uh, just over 100 years. Uh, my own background, so I've been in this role for about seven years now. My own background was a long career in consulting. I worked at Accenture, so a very big global consulting business. I did many different things there. Um, and my last eight years or so was as global managing director for all of the work that the firm did in supporting organizations around the world, very broadly in the HR space. So we did all the, what I like to think of as the people agenda. It's all the stuff on leadership, on organizational strategy, HR operations, HR services, technology, and so on. And, and, and that's actually always been my passion. I've done many different things in business, but my passion has always been about people at the heart of business. And it even began actually 
my own background is it's a very medical background. I got lots of doctors and nurses in my family and almost became a doctor myself. And then I studied a subject at a university called ergonomics, which is actually a combination of understanding people from a psychology and physiology perspective, but also systems and engineering and computing and how those two things come together. And I honestly can't think of a more relevant subject in today's world. So, so having had a long career at Accenture, I left there in 2009. And then amongst other things, I started to sit on some different boards. I chaired the Institute of Leadership and Management, and I was on the Council for City and Guilds. I was very involved with uh, youth enterprise and, and an organization called Junior Achiever Young Enterprise, which is about helping young people uh, develop entrepreneurial skills and, and absolutely love all of that. And much like Inga, I've also all, always had a very international perspective. I've worked in many different countries, worked with organizations around the world. Um, and I, I think the profession that I now um, help to represent is also a very international profession in terms of what we can learn from each other. And I've always believed in that sort of connectivity internationally and globally. So that was sort of my journey. And then I've all, I, you know, I don't think I've spoke to a chief executive, or I'm sure they're out there, that says they started their, their career by saying, one day I want to be a chief executive. <laughs> now, I think I've always believed you, you, you manage your career because nobody else is going to do it for you. And I've always wanted to go for opportunities where I felt that they were good for me to stretch me, but also things that I felt that I could contribute to. And when this opportunity came up to apply for the job of chief executive of the CIPD, I felt it just ticked so many boxes for me. Uh, as I said, I'm very passionate about the people agenda. I'm passionate about the HR profession, but I also felt that it needed to move and step up. And, and this was an opportunity to help in many ways for the profession to step up. So I suppose you, know, you, you plan your careers in various ways. And not that I don't plan my careers, or none of us do, but... But equally, it's about identifying and seeing opportunities that make sense to you and which you know you can contribute to, but also having the courage, much as Inga described, to be able to step up and take responsibility. And, and I've never been afraid to do that. And, and, and particularly when you come to chief executive roles, you have to be prepared to step up and take that responsibility because, and we may get into some of the dynamics of it, people have often described the chief executive role is the most lonely job in the organization and, and you've got to be prepared to take responsibility for a lot of things and to be prepared to you know seek your own guidance but of course seek guidance for others and supported boards and chairs are a very important part of that but you are putting yourself out there and and uh, so i don't think anybody should ever enter into these roles lightly but i am thrilled that i've had this opportunity just as i get described i'm very passionate about what i do i'm very passionate about the purpose of the organization and I count myself as incredibly fortunate to have landed in a place which for me is very fulfilling and hopefully that I'm also making a difference in. Well, thanks, Pete. And there's a few little themes coming out here, I think, around responsibility and challenge um, and also contribution to something that's worthwhile. So um, thank you very much for that. Um, moving on to Thomas then, please. Yeah, thank you. And I'll, I'll echo Inga uh, and, and Peter. So it's wonderful to be here and uh, to join the event. And I, you know, I, you know, I've worked with uh, the ACT and I think for a, at least a couple of years on advisory and now council. So, um, yeah, it's really interesting to hear actually that, that Inga and Peter talking about you know, passion and purpose and complexity and stepping up and uh, yeah, all of those things completely resonate with me. So a bit about my background. Uh, I, I've been in the, the technology industry for, for 25 years. Um, I don't count myself as a techie. I count myself as an applied technologist, which really means I'm a business person. You know, it's all about how do we use technology more effectively to get things done? Um, I, I, I've always wanted to, uh, to do something uh, at a global scale. I was very fortunate. I spent uh, 10 years of my career in Google. So I had three uh, executive roles there in their enterprise division uh, between 2007 and 2017. I, I had the gift of listening to, working with, uh, and helping executive teams across the world trying to figure out what to do you know when i first joined uh, in 2007 2008 we had a you know a small crisis economically and, and now looks what in front of us so you know it's very interesting i i have always wanted to do the things that are the most difficult and the reason why i stepped away from from google is that you know i i wanted to help organizations actually perform better and actually i felt that there was something missing and that for me was my calling 
I wanted to go and do something. We wanted to build a, you know, a global technology company that was helping executive teams really start to not just lean into headwinds that they were facing, but actually deliver against those. So um, yeah, a CEO role for me has been perfect. I've always wanted to do something more interesting than what I'd just done. So leaving Google was tough. I absolutely love being the CEO of my own business because I get to hire this wonderful team around me. Um, but yeah, just to kind of echo, echo your, your, the, the previous comments from Ingram and Peter, I also love the responsibility. There's no hiding. It is lonely, but I'm a huge believer in, in purpose, in, in passion, and you know, really kind of stepping up and helping people. So um, yeah, it's great to be here. And uh, it sounds like the three of us have you know, a, a slightly similar DNA in that things are driven with purpose. Absolutely. And uh, purposely, um, all the, the research shows having that purpose, having that, those values and, and knowing it really can help you for your, for your well-being and, and uh, really, you know, give you more satisfaction in life. So um, um, great. Thank you very much, Thomas, for that. I'll, I'll just very briefly maybe reflect on, on myself as the, the, the fourth uh, chief executive in, in, in the panel. Um, so um, as Peter said, do you really know you're going to become a chief executive? Well, I started out in a very different world, I was a professional musician. And then I moved into the finance world and I worked in um, blue chip companies. And some, most of my commercial time um, or time in the corporate world was with Unilever. Um, worked also with Novartis and others. And then moved into the not-for-profit sector. So working for complex organizations like Save the Children International um, and then the British Council. Uh, this is then, then my first uh, chief executive role. I've been in role three and a half years. And I suppose that my reasons for wanting to become a chief exec were around the same things that other people have said. I like a challenge, I like responsibility, and it's about people. I observed people in my past and I saw how they were chief executives or how they led their teams. I looked at the things that I didn't want to do, and I looked at the things that I did want to do. And I'm just very, very, very focused on people and uh, wanting to be, you know, wanting to add value, wanting to be a good chief executive. Um, that um, yep, delivers some value in, in some form. So um, that's that's why I'm in this role and enjoying it, loving it very much for all the reasons that, that the panel have already talked about. So today we're going to talk about um, transformation and uh, you know how that works for a chief executive. And at the moment, whether it's the accelerated change in our environment, the environmental conditions, whether it's the kind of social and governance, um, that's happening at the moment, the advances, the acceleration of digital and tech, not only in working from home, but that's really accelerated things too. Or things like the, the Black Lives Matter movement, which has coincided with this period under COVID-19. Um, th th such fast moving times. And there are various views as to whether you know, things will come full circle. Or um, it's a bit like, um, I don't know, there's different expressions, are there? There's a boomerang or full circle, or are we going to go part way and then come, or go to some extreme and then come back part way? Uh, there's all these different, you know, phrases and people talk about the, you know, building back better. They talk about the, um, the new normal. And I, I quite like the phrase, the next normal, which suggests that kind of continuum. Uh, like they say that, you know, these are probably uh, pretty um, sort of um, corny statements, but, you know, life's a river. And just that image for me, that, you know, there's never any going back, actually. It, it's, and it's never the same. It, it's always different. And that, that's, that's really intriguing. And, and, and it's very difficult for us to assess what the future is going to be like. Um, but yeah, are, are we going to, you know, how, how is it going to be? And how do you, um, as chief executives, see transformation in the current context? And what are the things that are changing fundamentally um, for you, do you think, for the long term? So who should we start with? Thomas, let's, let's continue with you for a moment. Yeah, I, thank you, Caroline. So I, I don't believe in the full circle at all because things are just fast changing uh, more so than ever before. Uh, look, I, even when I was a you know, much younger man, strategic planning for organizations was at three years. If not more, then it was two years and it's one year. And, and almost every chief exec that I'm talking to now is in the room with the CFO monthly, trying to figure out what are, where are we today? What should we do next and what order? And, and that is a, an incredibly different operational perspective that we've all had to change to 
Um, and actually what that is, that's put a lot of pressure on people who simply haven't got experience of doing that. I feel very fortunate that I've always worked in quite fast moving businesses where you've had to be quite naturally adaptive and agile, but that's simply not the case for, for other organizations. I think what, you know, what we are learning this year, and I, I reflect back again to 2008, you think about the economic crisis back then, what we had to do with very, very quickly was, you know, a, a lot of organizations were looking at a cost. It was a total cost of ownership discussion. We have to collapse down our cost. And then we started to ease into the growth agenda. It was about innovation. So how do I innovate my way to growth? But what's happened this time around in 2020 is a series of events actually quite different. And we all had to react very quickly into what I would call the defensive strategy, looking at business continuity or resilience. But the smart leaders that I'm speaking to right now have already had that eye on the growth agenda much, much faster. We're already hearing about, yes, that things have accelerated, things have been accentuated, but we are now starting to see a more aggressive transition, a dual strategy looking at the growth agenda with innovation, the role of culture. How do we collaborate our way to new products, new ways of working? So I think there is some, I do believe there is some mental muscle in boardrooms that have in the past had to deal with these very, very large global events. But I think even now transformation is accelerating across the board. It is very difficult, but what I can say is that those organizations that are taking the parallel defensive and the growth agenda and really looking for ways to, to reinvent themselves, to innovate, I do think will be the winners. That, and I'll, you know, I'll, I'll finish with saying the following, transformation and acceleration drives a gap between those companies that are successful and those that are at risk of, of not being so. Where we are now, halfway 2020, is that gap can very, very quickly become a gulf. And actually digital and transformation in particular, um, it just simply doesn't stand still. So I am actually telling people, look, it's actually now pace over perfection. And you know what, let's, let's bang heads, let's stumble, let's graze our knees, but Let's go, let's go fast and, and learn very, very quickly. Yeah. Thank you very much, Thomas. Great, great insights there for you. And um, we'll move on now to Inga, maybe to hear a little bit whether she agrees with Thomas or has a different view. No, uh, and thank you. And, and uh, I absolutely do agree with a lot of things that Thomas said, but I think it's, it's quite interesting because we come from very different organizations. Uh, the organization I represent is, is very far from, from quick and agile. It's, it's a, a hundred year old federation where we are struggling to, to, to uh, with our transformation agenda, even before this whole COVID crisis hit us. So we have for the last five years have, have had a quite uh, ambitious change agenda and we are investing a lot in, in transformation, uh, which for us t takes a long time. Uh, and uh, we are very much a boot on the ground uh, mindset organization. That's what we do. We are the humanitarian uh, involved in the crisis around the world. We are, are the advocates for, for rights in, in the UN and we are working with long-term development. And to get an organization like that to, to, to quickly change is a challenge in itself. What I really think is, is interesting in, in the times we're in now is that, that this is the first time, uh, and I've been in this organization since more than 25 years, and, and I think this is the first time where we really have a uh, a push from all part, all the boards around the Federation for change. So this is a, a, an opportunity we've never had before. And I, 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 and I think we need to see opportunity even in a, in a, in a serious crisis like this, because this is one of them. Uh, we are moving uh, at pace, slow compared to many others, but at pace for us in areas where we never uh, were able to, to come together before, because everyone realized that, that uh, there, there is no, no such thing as looking back. I also think, uh, as you were saying, Caroline, around the, the building back better than new normal. Uh, I think the, the normal was what 
got us here. So I think we have to reinvent ourselves to, to Thomas' point. Uh, and I think that the old ways of working, especially in, 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 in my uh, sector, the, the big INGO sector, we, the, the things that, that we took for granted, the things that, the way that we ran our business, uh, I don't think we will ever go back to that. I think we will do things very, very differently going forward. And that's, and some of it is, is what everything will, everyone will do differently is, is about being much more digital. And I'm, I'm super impressed. Things that would normally take, we had a, a plan for rollout of some big digital system. We had a plan for it, for, for that to happen over nine months. Uh, we did it in, in three days. So we also showed each other <laughs> that it is possible even for us to move at pace <laughs> and even for us to, to transform um, quickly. Uh, so I, I do see a lot of opportunity and I also see us all coming together. And, and for us, it's about uh, uh, the growth agenda. It's, it's about uh, making sure that, that we are investing ourselves out of this crisis. Because as an organization, as you can imagine, uh, we, as everyone else, is under financial constraints because of COVID. But at the same time, this is the time where the need in the world is, is the biggest that, that we've ever seen. And, we'll, and it will probably be that like that for the coming 5 to 10 to 15 years. And a lot of the progress we've seen in the sustainable development goals yeah, is being reversed. So the need is bigger than ever and, and the income is decreasing. So how do we how do we do things much smarter? How do we change and, and become this new version of ourselves? So I think that's a lot of things there that, that are really positive and where I see change. I just want to quickly on, on the culture piece, because you were also referring to the Black Lives Matter. Uh, I think that um, uh, this will transform my sector uh, in a way that it should have happened decades ago. But I also think that we are facing a situation where our, our own staff, our supporters, everyone we work with, the people that we serve, will no, no longer tolerate the old ways of looking at the world, the old ways of working. So there's, there's a lot of things that we need to do uh, as well when it comes to, to critically look at ourselves and, and uh, yeah, actually uh, coming to terms with, with what role we play in, in, in this world and what values we stand for. So, and I don't think we've seen the magnitude of, of that, that movement yet, but it will completely transform uh, us as COVID will uh, and climate, our sector. And, and uh, I, I look forward to that because I think that's, that's actually what is very much needed, but it will be difficult. And, and uh, People will not be accepting what they accepted a year or five years ago. I think also on the, on the whole, how we work, uh, no one will go back to how we used to work be before we could all work digitally, before we could con be in panels like we are today, like this. People will not travel. So it will be a total uh, change in, in how we do things. Indeed. And I, I wonder as well if um, maybe the not-for-profit world has a little bit of an advantage in some of this, because in the not-for-profit world, you, you've always had to really focus on your stakeholders rather than shareholders, if, if you like. And I think that's something that corporates are awakening to. So it's going to be interesting to see yeah, whether maybe maybe um, not-for-profits take the lead in this. I'd just like to maybe mm. pop back to one of them that you talked about doing something in three days instead of nine months. Um, something that's always fascinated me because um, prior to this role, most of my roles have been with very large organizations, very large international organizations. And it's always intrigued me how you get messages through the organization to create a common culture, because inevitably it becomes so large, um, unless you kind of chop it into bits and the theory of the, the tipping point and, and, and so on, uh, manageable pieces. You know, how do you get everyone behind something in such a large and complex organization? So I just wondered if, if briefly, that, that nine months to three days, what do you think were the one or two key things that made that happen? I think for us, uh, and this is also something that we struggle with, as an organization, I don't think that we often have a sense of urgency because everything we do is urgent. We, we are responding to humanitarian situations all the time and it's always urgent. So I think we, we have a slow pace. Uh, that, that's our natural way of doing things uh, in, in the business as normal. But I think that our ability to take the humanitarian mindset and applying this on, on the business as usual 
was actually what what made us move super quickly because if when you respond to to your humanitarian situation you don't have weeks you you have days you have hours so i think that we have that skill set and we haven't used it before so i think that that was actually what what made us uh succeed in this and and there's a lot of learnings that that we are trying to take from from that 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 part of our organization uh and and then for us to be, I, i think it's also it's it's partly to be able to continue to work but we also realize that we are all here to serve children and to deliver programs to children and if we don't move to digital that won't happen so it was it was the, the core mission that was threatened and then we act mm-hmm. well thank you very much Inga. that fascinating that mindset taking that humanitarian mindset um is a you know fabulous idea and um, i'll move on to peter now um have your thoughts on that yeah transformation yeah i mean i have a deck of us being said I, I, to some extent even go further i mean this is an opportunity i mean i think as inga said i mean every crisis represents both danger and opportunity and we are in the midst of several crises in the environmental crisis the health crisis a societal crisis around things like equality and inclusion and we've been reminded of that very starkly with black lives matter and all that's happened recently and we're certainly now into into an economic crisis and there is there couldn't be a more heady set of uh, context to drive real change and what what i've long observed is that many of the paradigms of work and how we've worked and what we thought business is even responsible for have been with us for a very long time let's take a couple of examples i mean things like which you just touched on the, uh, at the end there caroline about what inga was saying with the charitable sector that businesses have been driven certainly the private sector very much by a single stakeholder the financial stakeholder we've been driven by very short term metrics we're often rewarding and measuring those things on a very short term basis whilst we've talked about things like corporate social responsibility has business really acted responsibly in all these sorts of ways and if if you look about what is now being talked about and they're not new new ideas but i think what this crisis is doing is forcing us to reappraise what business is there to do and business's role in society and what a responsible business really is and this is not just window dressing this is really really fundamental stuff all the way from think about all your stakeholders how do you treat your employees the employees are a stakeholder and and oh my goodness are we being challenged on that and so many businesses when we go to things like restructuring everything how you treat your people and how you understand their well-being which has also become so much more of a central agenda during this lockdown What about your customers and your suppliers how are you treating them um and of course the environment is a stakeholder of business so this idea of a multi stakeholder uh, business and our responsibility to all of them has been called out very very strongly um other dynamics i would point to i mean what we're all learning now in this sort of different ways of working as, as we've already heard is that these aren't things that you're just going to flip back and say well, well that was all very interesting let's go back to commuting and nine to five working and presenteeism and all the other stuff we had because the honest truth and we we look at a lot of these things as ourselves as a professional body in hr things like stress at work biggest source of absenteeism being steadily growing mental health issues at work engagement that at best could be described as pretty plateaued inequalities growing at work in so many ways not just on reward but certainly inequalities of opportunity and have we really taken the diversity and inclusion agenda seriously So to me this is this is a, an enormous wake up call. We we need to go back to some very very fundamental questions which I think we are. I think the good news is that we are and I hear so many businesses saying things like you know we really really now get that you've got to put people front and center in your business agenda and you've really got to understand them and you got to understand things like well-being. Um and you know to echo what what Inger and Thomas have said our responsibilities to to grow sure we've got to ensure that our business is financially sustainable but in pursuit of what not just endless growth for the sake of it in order to make more money to keep financial shareholders happy but in pursuit of what and we all described at the very beginning things that drove us as chief executives was that sense of purpose and now i think we have a real opportunity to drive that idea of sense of purpose as to what is a business truly responsible for and of course it's there to ensure that it is keeping its financial stakeholders you know stable and happy that I mean we have a responsibility to ensure our business is viable financially but it is all these other things that were not at front and center of our agendas in the ways that I think they're becoming much more now 
And from that, I derive, frankly, a lot of hope. Because as I've said on many platforms, business is part of society and it should act accordingly. People spend more lives in work, uh, more, sorry, more of their life in work than almost anything else. And when it's done well, it, it is not only engaging, it gives us individual sense of purpose, which you've heard us all talk about. And that should be true throughout organizations at every level. So that, that's our opportunity. Mm -hmm. and, and that is transformation. And, but it is driving a transformation in our businesses from that bigger sense of, of purpose and principles of what we're trying to do. And then absolutely embedding the other things we talked about, our ability to be agile and responsive, to see technology as an enabler of greater reach and impact, not just to do things more efficiently and cut costs, but to enable what we do in better ways in a world that is clearly transforming. And, and that's what inspires me. Well, thanks, Peter. And I, I love the way you're focusing on, on, on the people there and, and that aspect. What I found it maybe intriguing, but also very frustrating through my career, particularly sitting in finance, is that people just don't seem to get when you talk about people and you're passionate about the people side of things, they kind of think it's it's because you're empathetic and you like people and you want to be nice and so on. And of course, all of that's true. But actually, this, the, that's the business case. You're you're not going to have success, financial success or any form of success if you're people are sick left, right and centre, yeah. unhappy, not performing at their best. Yeah. Um, and then there's, of course, the more kind of, um, yeah, the, the, the side of it that we do want a better society. We, we want people to have, you know, good lives. And, so, and as you say, the time that you spend at work is, is a significant amount of time. But there's also a very, very good business case for it, too. Um, but yeah. perhaps we could just um, uh, explore a, li a little bit um, uh, further on the people front. Uh, Peter. I mean, as, as chief executives, you have full responsibility for the operational side of the business and, and joint responsibility with your boards uh, for the strategic direction of the organization. And of course, people are, are hugely important to that. Uh, what have been the things that you have been um, actively doing through this, you know, this, this period of these, these last four months in order to lead your people um, in, in, in the best possible way you can? Mm. You want, you want me to start with that, Caroline? Kind of like. Yeah, I mean, what, what I found and what I've heard from many other chief executives is we have had to seriously up our game in how we connect and communicate with our people. I mean, there's absolutely no doubt about that. Whenever any organization goes through a lot of uncertainty and change, you realize the real, real importance of being a visible CEO. Because, you know, this is part of the loneliness of the job in a sense, isn't it? That but people do look to the leaders, and not just the CEO, but of course, you know, we're a, a, the, the chief leader, as it were, to say, well, do you know what's going on? What are you doing? How are you responding? What confidence can you give me? And are you being open and transparent about where we are? So I think the, the, the first thing I would say is that it has been a real you know, challenge and a wake-up call to say, how are we communicating? And and, you know, I, I'm sure we all do. We're doing you know, weekly video blogs, we're having many more kind of town halls and communicating and sending emails and all these other forms of channels of communication. And of course, for all of us, not just incidentally with our own organization, but our membership and our customers and our suppliers as well. So it really has reinforced that in my view. And, and what is intriguing, and, and Inga and Thomas both described in terms of innovation, and you touched on in terms of culture, is it has shifted our culture because it's it's even though we're working remotely in many ways it's brought us closer together we're facing some common challenges we're talking to each other much more we're respecting each other as individuals we're talking to each other about well-being and as one of my team reminded me today she said one of the big changes that's happened is is in a physical environment we've, we've got too used to the idea of this part of presenteeism culture of measuring and understanding people their inputs you know how many piece of paper you shuffle from one side of the desk to the other versus what you've produced and and now in, in what we're going through now and, and this sort of rapid innovation and agility and adaptation mm -hmm. is we're actually all starting to shift to a culture much more of not how many hours you spent at the screen but what have you done did, did you accomplish that can I help you accomplish it so so those cultural dynamics which we've all wrestled with I think interestingly have been brought to the fore and to me, and then certainly in, internally, we talk a great deal now about how do we take those things forward in the future? Whatever we end up with our ways of working, how do we take forward those positive learnings which have created a more agile and more connected culture in ways that 
frankly, would very hard to imagine would have been an outcome if you mm. said, you know, six months ago, this is what you're going to be doing. What do you think the outcome is going to be? Yeah, yeah. That's, uh, well, thank, thanks, Pete. And um, Thomas, culture is one of your specialisms as well. What, what, what's your thought about leading your people through um, through these times and anything else you'd like to add around the, the cultural perspective? Yeah, look, it's, it's very interesting. I mean, as you know, Caroline, I think I'm very fortunate is I've experienced from working in different companies and in working in high performance teams, what it brings to you as a person and to the team, as well as the company. I think, you know, to, to Peter's point about all, you know, all everything matters, stakeholders matter. And I, and I, I think now uh, the role of culture, how it drives behavior, how it can really support the purpose agenda it is it's never ever been so important and it's something i'm particularly interested in but also something i'm particularly passionate about um i, I think one of the things that you, you know you, you've asked is you know about what what have i had to do different? what have we all had to do differently and if you just look at if we just look at you know this year the global pandemic uh, black lives matter it's a series of events it's a series of events that have happened all at the same time. It's almost as if the term VUCA, volatility, uncertainty, complexity, it was, was, was actually designed for 2020. And it's again, it's, it's accentuated, it's accelerated the discussion. Now, again, to Peter's point, this sort of the, having to work in this new way has, for me, caused me to stop. It's caused me to pause and to maybe reflect a little bit more than I've been able to do in the past. I've, I've described myself as almost always being on the treadmill and at the, at the end of a week's holiday at the end of the year, then the treadmill goes even higher for the following year. So I think for me, I, I've tried to be, I've tried to be more conscious. I've tried to be more deliberate. I think with my board, it's very much about constant and reflective communication and then listening with the people that work alongside me, my business, it's very much about continuously listening in a, in a very empathetic fashion and then really addressing the communication needs of individuals, of teams and of the organization as is needed. So I'm a huge fan of pervasive leadership. I, I, I actually don't think leadership is something that is, is owned. It is something that is earned and it, and it really should be pervasive across a whole company. But to Peter's point, I actually have to say, yeah, you talk about a moment where you have to stand up and, and, and own it and, and just do your very, very best. And, you know, I, I try to always be transparent and tell people where we are and where we're not. Um, I'm sure I've, you know, I've done my best and, and I'm sure we've all made some mistakes over the last four or, four or five months. But I, I genuinely believe this, that the new way of working has made us all think about the need for a new way of thinking. And I think this, this moment to do things differently, to set that course for ourselves and society for the next five or 10 years, I didn't think it was going to happen in my lifetime. And we must not miss this opportunity to change almost a global mindset. And that moment is now. And I'm actually very, very optimistic um, about what can be achieved, but it's, it's up to all of us uh, to go and do that. Absolutely. And I like that pervasive leadership. But I'm also seeing through, through these times as well, and I, I like this, the expression radical uncertainty. It, 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 and, and we're going to be talking next week. Um, of course, uh, uh, we've got a wonderful speaker on the first day talking about uncertainty and how people deal with it. Um, and I think sometimes people do then in these times, they look for a leader for certainty. So sometimes you've got to shift a little bit. Sometimes it's it's that you know pervasive leadership as you describe, but sometimes then it's about decision making, being clear, as you say, clear and transparent and giving people a sense that there are some things that are at least certain around them and that not everything is uncertain. So, um, uh, but thank you very much. I'd like to move on to Inga now to talk about um, your approach to, to leading people through these times. Yeah, thank you. And, and I, I think a lot of things have already been uh, addressed by, by Thomas and Peter. Uh, and I, but so I, I, what I say will echo quite a lot of what they have been saying. I think this is the time where absolutely you have to be more visible than ever as a leader, because uh, people look for leadership in, in this uncertain times. Uh, so as, as everyone else, I've been focusing uh, extensively on, on, on uh, 
internal and external stakeholder management. Uh, we have been uh, having a lot of internal uh, town halls, a lot of different meetings, and we are still having them because uh, even if, if we don't uh, need them as frequently as, as we did, because quite a lot of the things that we put in place as a response to, 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 to COVID, uh, people were saying that we haven't been as close as, as this ever before. It, it really brings uh, added value where new groups of people come together and discuss critical issues. So some of these things that we put in place for the crisis will probably lead to new ways of working and communicating and, and, and uh, sharing information. We, will, we have a much, much more uh, broader focus on, on learning and, and uh, exchange of experience. So I think that that's a very positive outcome. For me personally, it's been super important to be absolutely clear in my focus on staff well-being because that's my responsibility as a CEO, but also to be uh, transparent and, and honest about some of the tough changes and, and choices <laughs> we have to make, uh, cost reductions, letting go of people. And, and, and so I think uh, it's it's absolutely challenging times. and, and um, I think every every organization everywhere experiences that that this with this upcoming uh, economic crisis and and people being redundant and and all the difficult choices you have to make uh, that impacts uh, people's lives is is absolutely <laughs> front and center. But I think that the way through it is to be to be transparent and also be very clear in communicating why you do some of these things. And and I think I know that. Uh, at least in, in my organization, everyone is driven by uh, passion for the mission and, and everyone wants to do what is right by the organization. So people can accept quite a lot of, of hardship uh, for, 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 uh, in, in, in uh, doing what is, is right uh, for the mission. So I think that, that is, is, has been super important. I've also been trying to work much more closely with my board because uh, uh, and we don't know yet what the implications will be, but um, I, I think now, now more than ever, uh, I felt that I need a, a strategic partnership with, with my board chair and the rest of the board uh, to, to prepare all of us for some of the decisions that we, we maybe need to make or maybe not, but to, to have that uh, discussion with them on risk about challenges, but also about opportunities, because as all of us have been saying, that's quite a lot of opportunities. Uh, I think it's critical to be authentic, uh, also to sometimes be vulnerable. So I've been doing quite a lot of, of sharing a lot of, I mean, just being there as a human being has been something that I think uh, ha has been important for me and that I think has really contributed to, to how staff feel. And my final point, being a global organization, uh, we have, we always had a lot of, of staff meetings where we had some people in, in the office in London, and then we had people remotely. And with everyone remotely, we are much closer than we ever were before. So I don't think that whatever happens, we will never go back to, to meetings where some people are present in the room and others are, are uh, participating virtually. We, we will continue to have these virtual meetings because it's much more, uh, we're much more connected, we are much closer, and much more people can participate. Yeah, it's kind of equalizing, isn't it? In many Absolutely. Ways. And I, I found that, you know, it's been great for me connecting with all of my team and we, we have two calls a week for all of us and I have drop in sessions and I've had talks with people that have been really, really important um, to me, but helping me also define what I'm going to do, whether it's we're talking about, you know, some of my team that are black talking about Black Lives Matter and helping me gain insights there or other people you know, helping where we're talking about well-being issues and people also asking me as their chief exec how I'm feeling. Mm -hmm. Um, which is really kind of humbling um, at the end of the day. It's, it's, it's been really fantastic. And um, we haven't got much more time, but I just want to whiz through the three of you very quickly, asking you two really, really quick fire questions. Um, one being, um, what's the one thing, or the main thing that you would love to see transformed for the long term? And secondly, what's the biggest learning that you've made or had through this period? And maybe stick with you, Inga, to start the ball rolling. Uh, oh, uh, the one thing that, that I, I want to see transform, and, and I, I'm not talking about uh, my, my 
both my own uh, organization and, and the, the, the society. And, and, and I think that that's what, I think it was you who said it, uh, Thomas. I think that this is the time for a real mind shift. I think this is the time where we can really reset some of the things that, that in our own organization or as a society that where, where we were actually heading in the wrong direction. So I think this is an absolute opportunity to, to reset that mind shift and, and get some things right. In my own organization, it's all about localization. It's about localization is, is about making sure that the decisions are made closest to, to the people that are affected and it, it will transform uh, the aid industry and it will transform Save the Children. Uh, my biggest learning, um, you can never uh, communicate enough and you, uh, there's always need for, for more clarity and, and people look for leadership. I think I knew that already, but it's been in my face every day. Thank you very much, Inga. Um, and if we um, just uh, pop to Peter next, um, asking the same two questions, please. Yeah, I think uh, transferring to the longer term, I mean, I, I sort of pitched this this thought about responsible business, which I certainly want to see. But but I think within the organisation, I, I would sort of echo what, what has been said by Inga, that, that I think you can talk about it as ways of working, that, that we've been taught very, very different ways of connecting and working and how that plays out into the culture of connection and support to each other and therefore driving innovation. So I, I would sort of frame it like that, but it is absolutely taken forward to these lessons we've all learned about how we work and how we connect with each other. Um, and I, I think, as I said, and as you think I just said, I do think, yeah, biggest learning probably is communication. Yeah, it, it's a, I think I've heard, uh, as I said, many business leaders describe it this way, that as a business leader, you, you're out there an awful lot. You, 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 you think you're being visible because you're, you're out there connecting with the world and you're the chief spokesperson for the organization. And, and we all do a lot of that. And we spend a lot of time doing that. And it is a very important part of our role. But I think probably the things we haven't focused enough time on is our internal visibility and how we connect and communicate with our own organizations. And that, to me, has also been my biggest learning about how we connect with our organization, how we communicate with everybody, and, and the absolute need for that, not just now because we're in a very difficult time, but actually that has to be something we take forward as a, as a longer term learning as well. Absolutely. Thank you, Peter. Thomas. Yeah, it's it's a really, it's a couple of two very good questions. I'm actually just going to restate what, uh, what I think both Inga and I have mentioned already. If you were... I believe if you were to go and ask a thousand chief executives, what, what would be like the one thing that they would like from their organization is to have the right mindset. You know, it's the, it's the culture, it's the purpose, it's the ambition, it's the alignment. I'm a huge believer in, in sort of like the, the ways of thinking. And for me, I think where we've got to now, and especially in 2020, is that people feel they have a voice. And that actually what they say and how they're heard allows them to make choices. So for me, I think this moment is, it's not just about the macro. I do feel that for the first time, even generationally, people thought they're being heard and that actually the choices that they make can make a real difference. And in terms of the, you know, the second question, you know, and I'll answer from an organizational perspective, the world is never going to be less digital than it is today and organizations can choose how they respond again they have choice of how quickly and how they respond both as an individual and as an organization and i i would you know strongly encourage um companies and, and leadership teams to to really look at that defensive but also that sort of growth agenda and the growth agenda is not just about top line growth it's about what do we want to do as a company, as an organization in the next two, five, 10 years? And lastly, I'll say just me very personally, and I think Peter's point, you know, being a CEO is, is definitely very, very lonely. And I had a, a very touching moment where one of my newest hires into the, into the organization a few weeks ago, a marketing associate, when we were having a, you know, a, a discussion over a, over a house said, how are you? And I, I, I was literally bowled over because I think Peter and Ingalls, we don't often get asked that question, let alone by someone who's new in. You know what? I took away from that 
I think we got quite a special culture in Temporal and I was just very thankful for someone to ask me that very genuinely. Um, so that's my sort of very personal story. Thanks, Thomas. Well, thank you all so much for being so honest and, and sharing your fascinating insights um, with, with our audience today. Um, I can't thank you enough. It, uh, for me, it's been an absolute pleasure and I, I've also you know, learned a lot. Uh, so just thanks once again. And um, yeah, um, we hope to have you back again soon. Thank you, Caroline. Thank, thank you. you. Very welcome. Thank you. Thanks.